Hi everyone and welcome to the next in my series of paint along demos in soft pastel. This might be number nine of these now. I have quite a series of them growing here on YouTube covering all sorts of different subject matters from people portraits, all sorts of uh, wildlife, pet portraits, birds, landscape. I'm really trying to cover a bit of everything in this series to give you guys here on YouTube the chance to paint along with me and learn lots about soft pastel. This time I'm going to change it up again with a bit of insect life and this lovely bee and some little flowers. So I hope that you'll work along with me. If you do and you enjoy this then please do subscribe here on YouTube. It really helps me to continue to make all of this content for free. Also, if you can, go and check me out on my Patreon channel. There you can support me even more and also gain access to my full catalogue of real-time tutorials. And join our growing community of super supportive artists who are all at different parts of this artistic journey. But even if you can't subscribe there, just hitting the subscribe button here on YouTube, leaving me a comment, sharing this video, all of that is a huge help. And you can find out some other ways to show me a bit of support in the description below. But I hope that you really enjoy this and that it gives you a good taste of the world of soft pastel. So this month on my Patreon channel, I've been talking loads about complementary or opposite colors. And in particular, yellow and blue violets. And then one day in my garden, I'm watching these spectacular giant bees flying around that we have here in the south of Spain. And all I could see was yellow and purple everywhere I looked. And I started taking some photographs and it's one of those photos that have inspired this little demo. So if you want to work along and you want to download the high resolution image, Visit me on my Patreon channel, there you can get access to the full resolution image along with a gridded version and a line version to get you started. But I'll also add the image here on screen if you just want to pause this video for a few moments and use that to sketch from. So let's give you some more information about the materials that you'll need if you want to work along with me. I've cropped my paper to 8 by 9 inches. So I'm keeping this pretty small so that I have some chance of getting it done in a few hours. But you can make it as big or as small as you like. I would suggest not going any smaller than this so that you really can make the bee quite big and go into a bit of detail. I'm also using a paper that I don't always use. Quite often I'm working on either Hannibal Velour or Clairefontaine Pastel Mat. And this is actually Fisher 400 paper, which I've tried it once in my recent paper comparison and I loved it. So this gives me a good excuse to have another go on it. Something that's not too big, not too complicated, just a nice way to experiment further with a new paper. But really, you can work along on whatever paper you choose. The same techniques that I'm using will pretty much work on any paper. I would say that the main difference between this paper and the other papers that I normally use is that it feels a little bit more rough. So it's a bit more sandpaper like. Um, and the pastel mat and the velour that I'm used to are both quite smooth or soft. So for this, I have set myself out quite a few pastel blenders. Um, and I'm going to avoid trying to blend too much with my fingertips as I know from previous experience on the more sanded papers that you end up with no fingerprints at the end. So the main difference is that you might see me using a lot more blenders than my fingertips. And I've already laid out some colours to get me started. These may not be the exact colours that I end up using but I like to choose a palette of colours at the beginning when I'm analysing my photo reference. And that really gives me a good start to have a plan of what colours I'd like to use. But here on screen now, I will show you the exact colour list that I have used for this bee so that you can gather these colours together and work along with me. 
I really hope that you enjoy this one, whether you're just watching along or whether you're planning to work along with me. But I've been so looking forward to this, so let's make a start. So the first thing I'm going to tackle is the background. I always like to get the background in first and then I can really work at adding those fine edges and details to the main subject. So this background has quite a lot going on even though it's a sort of out of focus blurry kind of background so like a bokeh background as it's called in photography terms and if you've seen any of my other work you'll know that I quite like a bokeh background as it tends to really bring the focus to the main subject. So I'm just marking the rough halfway point that we get within the background. There's some darker colours up around the top which is really going to help set off this sparkly wing and then there's a lot of different greens going on around the base of the painting. Of course I'm going to try and simplify what I can see um, especially just for the purposes of this demo to speed things up but as well as that I don't want to include absolutely every little piece of detail in this background. I really just want to create a nice colourful backdrop that's going to really set off the main subject. That's my main aim with the background. Not to distract from the subject, but to create something that really complements and draws our eye more to the detail in the little bee. So I'm just uh, sort of marking in where the darkest areas are in the top half. And I am using a black Faber-Castell stick here. I don't mind using pure black. I'm going to come over the top of this with more colour. But sometimes coming in initially with black gives me the darkness and the contrast that I want. So that's the thing if you're using a good pastel paper that allows you to build up the layers gradually. It's not going to be a problem covering over some of this black with colours afterwards. The paper will allow me to do that. And of course I am sort of experimenting with this piece as well because I've used the Fisher 400 paper once just for a very small experiment and I haven't really done a full background like this. So this is a bit of an experiment for me as well. I'm expecting the paper to not do what I normally have my papers do, so I'm expecting to have a little bit of trial and error in this. Certainly when it comes to blending, I'm going to have to experiment a bit because I'm used just coming in with my fingertips and blending everything together like that. But I think I'm going to lose my fingerprints if I do that on this paper because it's quite rough. It really feels um, quite sandpaper like. So I do value my fingertips a little bit. And I'm just going to experiment with some different um, sponge type blenders. This is one of the blenders that I got along with um, Pan Pastels. And rather than using my fingertips just to soften all of that black pigment into the paper a bit. I'm just going to use the sponge because it's really going to save my fingertips. What I really want from this is just to create a bit of depth in the background, in the top part of the background at least, where there is a lot of darkness going on, as that's really going to help set off the bright colours in the bottom half of the painting. So it seems very stark and um, drastic to come in with black and I know that a lot of artists don't like to use black but I do like to use it uh, when I'm trying to create something with a lot of depth and as I said I'll come over the top of this with a lot of other colours so it won't just look black at the end. But I'm certainly not afraid to use black when it is required. So yeah, it will just be interesting to see how this paper reacts 
and how that differs from the pastel mat and the velour papers that I normally use. And what I really liked about the Tim Fisher 400 paper when I last experimented on it was just how vibrant the colours went on to it. That's why I've chosen to do this very colourful little study on it, just to give it another chance to show how vibrant those pastel colours look on it. So I'm really not sure how this is going to work out. It's always a bit of a leap into the unknown when you're trying a new paper. And if you're new to pastel, well, every paper is a new paper. And it is scary. It's scary experimenting because, well, you don't know if it's going to work out. It's really nice to sit down to a painting that is within your comfort zone one that you're pretty sure you can get to a very nice finish but it's much much different um, in feeling to sit down to something that you've no idea how it's going to work out but I've got to say it is a little bit exciting to sometimes to jump into the unknown and just see what happens so that's what I'm doing with this piece I have found on the Tim Fisher that if I'm extremely gentle with the blending with my fingers then I can save shaving that top layer off my fingertips but I've got to be really soft with the, uh, the pressure that I apply to the paper here so I'm just being very careful barely touching the paper here just smoothing all of that in So I'm really going to try and bring some lovely vibrant colour into this background. Try and mirror some of the lovely colours that are happening on the bee himself. And really try to use all of the colours around the bee to enhance each edge of the bee, so really try and help each part stand out. But yeah, so far I'm really enjoying how the pastel actually applies to this paper. This is what I found the last time and what attracted me to trying this again because it just goes on really thickly, like really solid. Uh, really feels like I'm painting on this paper. So yeah, I think I'm going to enjoy this. And hope that if you're working along on whatever paper you're choosing to work along on, I hope that you will enjoy this too. It's always exciting being at the beginning of a painting. So yeah, let's try and have fun with this one. Now that I can see some of these shapes start to emerge, I do want to bring in the darker blacks again because I really want this top half to have a lot of darkness and depth to it.
I'm just instead of using my soft pastel here, I'm using the harder Faber Castell stick because it won't fill the paper up too quickly. Although you can see that there's quite a lot of dust fall off on this paper. Something that I don't get that much of on the pastel mat or the velour paper. Um, that's partly why I really like those papers. They don't create a huge amount of dust. Whereas as soon as you move on to one of these more sanded papers, you're inevitably gonna create a bit more of a dust storm. So just bear this in mind if you're working with pastel, if you have um, any respiratory issues, make sure that you're working in a well ventilated area, have windows open beside you, and try to avoid blowing on to the piece, directly onto the piece, as you'll make a lot of that soft pastel airborne and then you'll be breathing it in. So my best tip for that is to work upright like this with an easel and just simply let your pastel dust fall to the, the little edge on the easel. Um, if you're working upright then gravity should help you out a lot and um, get rid of a lot of the dust from the surface of your painting. But yeah, some people do find it difficult to work with soft pastel because of the dust it creates. I would say if you've had that problem in the past, certainly look at some other paper types because not every paper creates a huge amount of dust. Have a look at pastel mat. Um, you can you can be quite heavy handed with the pastels on pastel mat and you'll have very little dust created while you're working on it because it's quite a smooth paper. So that, that's definitely one of the downsides to the more sanded papers. So yeah, I'm just blocking in the minute, laying in some little patches of green. And I'll try and get the whole background done before I start any work on either the flowers or the bee. I really like to have this part done before I start work on any foreground stuff. And you can see that I can just not worry about the going over the edges of any of this. I can just let the pastel go over the edges a little bit without worrying. And once I have this background in then I'll be really focusing on getting the finish of all of these little edges to be just how I want it. So it really helps that you've got the background in first. Of course everyone works in a different order so this is just how I work. There's really no right or wrong. So I'm finding that it's much easier to blend on the paper using my fingertip. Once I've got a layer or two of pastel on the paper, it doesn't feel quite as rough. Thank goodness for that because I really am in the habit of using my fingertips. And it's one of the reasons that I love soft pastel is getting messy hands. So I would hate to think that I couldn't do that on this paper. <laughs> Just be careful if you're using one of the more sanded type of papers. Bear in mind that it will hurt your fingertips a little bit. So yeah, this part is not an exact science. I really just want to get the colors blocked in, rough shapes, trying to look at the overall thing. 
Um, not worried about any detail anywhere. And of course the main tip that I have for these out of focus backgrounds is to avoid any kind of detail. So try to do it all with the soft sticks. If you're going to use pastel pencils, save it for later when you're actually adding detail to the main subject. But if you can manage to do the whole background just with your softer sticks, then you're going to create a much more soft and painterly effect. So I don't mind if I go over the edges of the bee a little bit here, that's going to help me create those nice edges later on. But I suppose I am paying a little bit of attention that I don't completely lose my outline. And in this bottom half there's quite a lot going on actually within this blurry out of focus area more than you would think when you do actually hone in on it and start to look at it. So I'm really not going to go into too much detail hopefully. I'm going to try and simplify what I'm seeing. Just go for the nice blasts of colour here and there. Really just picking out any nice prominent shapes that I can see. I really enjoy these backgrounds because I don't have to stick to the photo reference. So in most other things when I'm painting, it's all about getting a likeness in my portraits, in my pet portraits. People want them to look exactly like their beloved pets, of course. That's usually the point of a good portrait. But with stuff like this and with the backgrounds in my portraits, I can really play around and have a bit more fun than normal. I'm not as much of a slave to the photo reference when it comes to the out of focus backgrounds. More just trying to create something that works compositionally and something that adds to the painting rather than it looking exactly like the photo reference. So if you're working along, perhaps your background will turn out quite different from mine and it'll still resemble the photo reference in a way. So I like the fact that I'm able to just be a bit more free, make decisions as I go. And of course, because pastel is quite forgiving, I can change my mind. If I apply something that I don't like, So it takes the worry out of it. I'm always saying this, but if I were working in watercolour, I would find it so much more difficult because it's much harder to make mistakes with watercolour. I have a lot of respect for watercolour artists because in most of the styles of painting with watercolour, you've got to plan ahead. You've really got to know what you're doing. You can't just um, slop a load of colour down and then worry about your highlights later. You've got to know those things before you start. 
Whereas with me, I'm not too worried about where my highlights need to go because they will go nicely over the top of the darkest of pigment here. So it's not a concern to just play around. So I did say I'm gonna experiment with these blenders. But I think it's really hard to beat your own fingertips because the blenders tend to remove some of your pigment. And your fingertip, I find, doesn't remove quite as much of the colour. But for this lower layer, I'm just going to take the opportunity to save my fingertips. But yeah, I'm just not as big a fan of blenders because they tend to take some of your pastel off the paper. And I find these pastels are so precious. I really want to make use of every little bit of pigment. So the directness of the stick straight on the paper and the tactile feeling of using my fingertips to blend is really what I love about pastel. But I can just try and get a bit more pigment on the paper here quickly and maybe that will help my next layers to not hurt my fingers as much. So at this stage, what I'm planning with the colour is really thinking about where the darkest edges are on the bee and trying to put some of my lighter background colours in those areas so that the dark areas of the bee really contrast against that. And there's really a beautiful mixture of colours in the background. Most of which I'm going to try and include because I just love how they all come together. Nature really is the master at combining colours. Nature does not need to know colour theory. It is colour theory. And this month on my Patreon channel, for example, I've been talking lots about using opposite colours. And as I was creating one of the tutorials for this month over there, I happened to be out in my garden and these bees were flying about all over the place. Absolutely hundreds of them. And I realised that I'd just come from talking about my love of using yellow and purple against each other. And there these guys were, with their little heads covered in pollen, making their heads totally this vibrant yellow colour. And then the sunshine just glinting off their sparkly wings. 
which were shining bright purple. So many ways that nature can inspire your use of colour. Nature is the master painter. And of course it's inspired generation after generation of painter. So I'm going to try and not change too much about the colours that are included in the background. Just try to slightly simplify what I'm seeing. And hope that I can make those colours sing just as nicely in my painting as they do in the photo reference. Because it's really what attracted me to this photo reference to paint. Not only is the bee spectacular, but this collage of colours in the background is just really inviting. And purple is definitely one of my favourite colours. But always when I'm asked what my favourite colour is, it's a combination really of purple and green. And nature just loves purple and green together. So although we tend to see purple and yellow as opposites, yellow can be also in the green category. And some of the greens that I'm using in this background, like this one up here, it's very yellowy. So green and purple do work really nicely against each other. I just love how solidly the pigment goes onto this paper. That's what impressed me first time round and it's doing it again. The colours just look so lush on this paper. I have not been a fan of the sanded papers, but I am fast becoming a fan of this one, which makes me think that maybe I misjudged the other ones and I need to give them another go. And that can often happen when you try a paper once. I'm always saying that you've got to give a paper more than one chance. Your first attempt is all about figuring it out and learning. And then you really need to take what you learnt and have another go. So I've made that mistake in the past where I've misjudged a paper or surface and I've presumed that I don't like it and what's really happened is um, I needed to take what I learned that time and have another go. So I always recommend if you're going to try a new paper, try it more than once. Give it a second chance because the paper that I use for a lot of my work, the paper that I've used for 90% of the work I've done in the last 12 years, the velour, I actually hated it the first time I tried it. So I know many of you dislike that paper. Well, I did too on my first attempt. I really didn't enjoy it. But I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it and um, that can be a bit off-putting, a bit daunting. Gets you feeling a little bit panicked. But thankfully, I persevered with that paper because I'd seen what other artists could do with it. And I knew that there must be some trick 
that I needed to master in order to get along with that paper. And that's always the case. There are some papers that you just won't ever like, that is true. Most artists have favourites and most artists have some papers that they just do not like. But I always suggest having multiple attempts if you're experimenting with a paper because that first try just might not um, be your lasting impression of the paper. Perhaps you just need to give it another chance. And I definitely stress to not put pressure on yourself when you're trying a new paper. Don't expect to create a masterpiece. Try and get that out of your head before you start. Just look at it as an experiment. Be prepared to feel. And don't have that added pressure on yourself where you need to create something perfect every time. It's in those failures that you learn the most. And if you don't fail at something, well, you're probably not learning. So don't feel bad next time you have a bit of an artistic failure. It just means that you are learning. So it looks a bit of a mess right now. That must mean it's going well. These backgrounds usually look a bit of a mess in the beginning. So I'm pleased about that. Hope yours looks a mess too. And it always helps to just take your time when you're doing something like this. Really stand back from it every once in a while. Get a good look at it from a distance. That's often the key with the, the out of focus backgrounds. Often less is more. And there's really a limit to how much you need to do to this kind of background before it looks really good. And sometimes it's difficult to see until you actually get your main subject in. So I would say just to try and not go overboard. I usually aim to try and fill all of the gaps on the paper first. Try and roughly block in where the colours go without being too fussy about it. But my main aim really is to fill the paper, cover each gap on the paper and then I can really start to assess and move things around, add more marks, more colours, but you can do that much better once you get all of the gaps filled in. So that's really my first aim with this kind of background. And I'm really just looking at the photo reference a lot at this stage, making decisions which shapes and parts in the photo reference do I want to include?
And once you start to get more layers of pastel on the paper, you'll start to notice that with your blender or with your fingertip, you really start to create marks on the pigment. And some pastel painters like to leave just the marks that they get from their sticks showing. That's sort of the more traditional way to paint with pastel where you really leave it unblended. So not every pastel painter actually blends like this. It's definitely a feature of my work though and I really love the effects that you can get um, almost using your fingertip like a paintbrush to leave your, your visible mark on the pigment. So, so far my fingertips are intact. It's not too bad. But I'm not applying a lot of pressure here. I'm really taking it easy on the blending. So bit by bit, just filling in the gaps, really planning, thinking about the composition as I go. Thank you. 
So the main thing that you want to avoid if you're trying to create this soft out of focus effect is any hard lines anywhere. So I'm really trying to soften each little edge. Going for that really fuzzy, dreamy look. So one of the things that I particularly like about velour when I'm creating this type of background is that you've really got to almost scrub at the paper to make the pigment move. And that I suppose gives me a certain level of control that sometimes these other sanded papers don't allow because you can see that once I get a few layers on the actual surface the pigment wants to move around a lot and the opposite of that can seem strange at first but it's the control that some of those other papers give me that mean I'm able to create really cool effects in my backgrounds that if the pigment just slides around uncontrollably it can be difficult to achieve so that's one thing I've got to just be wary of on any of these sanded papers, just making sure that I don't go overboard and add too much pigment to the paper and then it just becomes a bit of a mess and a bit difficult actually to um, get the pigment to go where I want it. It can start to get a little bit out of control. So the whole time I am being quite light with my touch. I'm not applying loads and loads of pastel in one go. I'm really trying to build it up gradually and see how each layer looks as I go, really judging it as I go. Whereas if you just come in really heavily at the start and really try to color in really heavily all over the place, you're gonna find it difficult to, to add more pigment afterwards to add definition where you want it. You really want to try and do this gradually, build it up gradually.
so yeah just continuing to fill in the gaps and blending very carefully and lightly with my fingertips but so far that's working I do have a feeling that the Fisher 400 is a little bit kinder to the fingertips than UART paper, which I've also tried a few times. And I like it, I like how it accepts the pigment. But no matter how soft I tried to blend, I find it really did try to eat my fingertips. But this I can manage to just go a little bit lighter and just about managing to get away with it. So yeah, really enjoying this paper. Like I said, just try and avoid any hard lines. And when you do start to get some layers covered in, like this whole right side now, I've covered all of the paper. Before starting to add any brighter highlight colors, I can just take my finger and ever so lightly rub over the whole thing, just really lightly, carefully. But it just softens everything back there, sets it further away into the distance. can really start to pick out some little areas of highlight.
So really just softening this top area, setting it further back and also breaking up some of the dark black areas with a bit more colour over the top, mostly this lovely rich purple colour. So I'll just start to refine this other side now. Still looking a little bit rough right across this area. And perhaps I just want to slightly lighten around this part of the bee because it's quite a dark part on the wing and on the body here and I really want the body to pop from the background. So just looking at the colours that I have coming right around the shape of the bee, making sure that it's going to make a nice contrast. Perhaps I can just lighten some of the areas closest to the bee here. So I'm not too concerned if I lose a little bit of the shape of the bee. Probably before I start working on him I will just redefine the outline with pastel pencil. But at this stage it's not too much of a concern. So you can see now that I've got some layers on the paper. It's really nice just to come in and dot in a little bit of colour and see how nicely that blends into the colour underneath. So I've heard some people say that you shouldn't really blend pastel or mix colours but it's one of the things that I really love to use in my work especially with this type of background because it just adds so much depth. Of course it's lovely to come in with the correct colour when you have the perfect colour of stick but sometimes I use the mixing and the layering up to add that extra depth because it's not just the one colour that you can see in the end it's a little mixture of all of the colours that you've put down and it looks really rich and just as I said adds a lot of extra depth to my work So this is that gorgeous yellowy green that I was describing earlier. Definitely one of my favourite colours. And I'm really enjoying just 
how vibrant and solid the colours look on this paper. So I'll not spend too much longer on the background. You're going to see that once I start to add the detail on the flowers and the bee in, that backgrounds like this can really take on a life of their own. And it's often the detail that you start to come in with that starts to really bring that background to life. So I'm not going to spend too much longer on this. Just work another few moments perhaps on this side. And then we'll make a start on the, the bee and the flowers. And you'll notice that sometimes I use my little finger as well. Um, and I'm saving the little finger sometimes for when there are darker colours involved. And then I'm doing a lot of my other blending with... I, I tend to do most of my blending with this finger. Um, and in this case I'm just kind of swapping between the two so that I don't get a dark pigment going into my lighter areas. And every so often I will go and clean my hands but to be honest they do get pretty dirty before I think it's time to go and clean them, so uh, that's just one tip to use different fingers. Try and save one finger for when you want to blend lighter colours. And perhaps you're using blenders instead of your fingertips, which is probably a wise decision if you're using the sanded paper. But honestly I'm not finding this too sore on the fingertips. I'm being really gentle in my blending. So yeah, I usually say not to get too carried away with spending ages and ages on these backgrounds. It's best to move on sometimes before you think it's finished. And you can always come back in and add extra definition if you feel that it needs more.
And again, I'm just using the photo reference as a mere suggestion for what to do. So really not sticking by it completely photorealistically here. But yeah, just loving how smoothly and vibrantly the pastel is going on to the paper. Really enjoying that. So perhaps I'll just add a couple of nice highlights over on this part and then we'll make a start on the B. So again, just checking right over it that I haven't left any hard edges anywhere, really softening everything. The more you can soften this, the further into the distance you will send this background. And I really love creating that distance between the main subject and the background. Just makes all the detail that you add later on really pop out from the picture. So it's just like getting your long lens on on the camera and focusing in on something close up. Just sends all of those background colours into a lovely blur. So yeah, I think that's probably close enough for now. As I said, if you want to do more to the background, you can always do that at the end. As long as I've got the areas directly around the bee pretty much finished, then I'm good to make a start. So the first thing I will do is just um, strengthen my outline again, anywhere that I've lost that. So just having a look at the shape of the bee. And I've come over the edges of him a little bit in some places. Not a big deal, but it helps me when I move on now to get the outline again. And I really want to make sure that I've pretty much overlapped those colours that they do actually come over the edge of the bee in some places. Sort of get lovely crisp edges between the bee and the background. There's no little gaps in the paper.
So I can just see some little uh, gaps in the wings here where you're going to actually see some of this lovely background colour through. I'm going to just make sure that I've dragged some of that pigment up in to allow you for those little gaps. And I've also left a little space here where I haven't applied any pigment. So I'll just fill that in. So yeah, that's the background pretty much done. I definitely could spend a lot longer on this, but even as it is, it's quite a pleasant and colourful background, which will hopefully set off the bee really nicely. So let's make a start on him. So I'm just going to work this little top area of flowers here first. Again, I've tried to make the background around them nice and dark so that my colours really show up. But I also don't want to spend too long on them as I'm not too worried if they're completely in focus either. I'd quite like if there's a little bit of blur going on with them too, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this little area. I do want them to be slightly more in focus than the background though. Just creating all those different layers within the painting, adding more interest. So I'm still using the bigger sticks for this, even though it's a little bit more detailed. But you can still surprisingly find a lot of precision with the big sticks, just by making use of whatever sharp edges you can find. And I definitely recommend if you're trying to find a more painterly approach in your work to try and only use the big sticks then because that's going to really force you to loosen up more and not rely on the sharp edges that you get from your pencils. So anytime I'm trying to be looser, more painterly, I try to just use the big sticks. So just blocking in the stems. And the green parts of these buds. So they're not really fully open flowers, more like little buds. And of course, if I mess up a little bit, I can always use the background colors to come back in and just neaten up a little bit. So I don't have to get the pigment on the paper in the perfect place first time. Just roughly getting the shapes of the buds in.
and then like I said I can use the sharper edge of the black fabric castell stick and just shape that a little bit better for the smaller areas where perhaps my fingertip is a little bit too big to blend then I can start to make use of some of these lovely pointed blenders little sponge tips on them again these are the pan pastel tools but I tend to use them with all of my pastels not just with pans So yeah, these are definitely a great tool to have when you need a more delicate touch in your blending. And just in general for softening lines, um, blending those smaller areas. So you can really start to treat the pigment like paint when you use these blenders.
So the little flowers themselves are white, but I want to be quite sparing with my use of white in this. Coming in with uh, slightly more muted tones to begin with, and maybe just a few little highlights in white. You really want to try and limit your use of pure white where you can. And just save it for those brightest highlights where they appear. So some of the little buds appearing a bit further away and I'm really going to try and leave them quite loose and again a bit distant looking. And perhaps just focus a little more attention on these front two flowers, add a little bit more detail to them. But I'm quite happy to let some of these flowers sink away into the background as well. And you can see that I'm using some really small little crumbs of pastel. I save every little piece as it wears down or gets broken. 
but some of these pieces are my favourite little bits of pastel as they are what makes it possible to add some areas of detail without needing the pastel pencils because you never get quite the same vibrancy from adding pencil as you do with the softer sticks. So all of those little crumbs become really useful when you're trying to add detail. So yeah, just working my way around the slightly out of focus flowers in the background. Sometimes you just got to be careful where you're leaning your hand because you can see that I'm smudging a little bit on the areas that I've already worked over here. And luckily, because it's a blurred background, it doesn't really matter too much. But when I'm working on the B, I may well tape a bit of paper over part of my painting just to keep it clean and allow me to stabilize my hand and lean it on the paper without having to worry. So each little bud's pretty small within 
this composition so there's not a huge amount of detail I can go into unless I start to really spend a lot of time on each one and they're really just there to support the bee so I don't want to spend too much time on each individual part but you really could go into a lot of detail on these if you're going for hyper realism and that's really the key to realism um, a lot of the time it just takes time you've got to have a lot of patience So just trying to create that little area of dark contrast that will really help these pop out. And then if I want to tone down some of the black again, just coming in with some of my lovely uh, blue violet here. So yeah, a little bit of fiddly business here, but uh, just wanting to get the edges of these buds nice. Make them stand out from the really distant background behind them. Whilst at the same time not making them too detailed and just putting them in their own little plane of field. between the background and the bee. So it really helps when you're trying to create a lot of depth in a piece to create lots of layers. I don't just mean building up the layers of pastel, I just mean lots of layers of depth within the painting.
So some little bits of detail on these Ford flowers. Again, just trying to use the bigger sticks, finding little sharp edges on them. So it's just tricky to find a place to anchor my hand a little bit. I'm trying to really just use the sticks for details like this. Still not wanting this to be super detailed. Saving that for the bee.
So yeah, really just dotting a bit of colour. And of course, if you prefer, you can take a bit of pastel pencil and just neaten up some of these uh, little, not sure whether to call them petals, they're so small. But I'm quite happy to leave them looking quite loose. So again, this little crumb of grey 27, very useful for these small places. Don't be afraid to break your soft pastels when you need a sharp edge. The more little pieces that you have like this, the better. So yeah, I think that's probably enough on the, the those top flowers. If again I have time at the end, maybe that's something I come back to and add a bit more detail into those. But I think that once I get the detail on the bee, those are going to look a lot better. And also I've got those flowers just to the bottom of the bee to do, but I will leave those until I'm finished with the bee so that I'm not leaning on them the whole time that I'm painting the bee.